Hi, Ben here from Supercoach Insider. Today I'm going to summarise all of the Sunday, the Easter Sunday games for you. The reason I'm going to probably put these two games together is because there's not a whole lot of Supercoach relevancy uh, outside of a handful of people. So this should be nice and simple. If you haven't already, please do like and subscribe. Let me know if you're enjoying this content so far this weekend. But uh, Essendon and GWS, it was a butcher fest. Like so many missed targets, um, you know, and... Also, a tale of two sides of the story as well as far as half of footy because Setterfield absolutely, you know, coming off the bench, so started slow coming off the bench, um, got to work, went from like 4 to 24 really quickly and was killing it at half time, and then pretty much tapered off in the second half. And what makes things even more frustrating is, you know, Essendon, some of his teammates were just ignoring him and he was open, and they just ignored him and just butcher it somewhere else. Like, it was just really frustrating to watch that they didn't actually use him and link up, but I think he showed enough to be super impressive as far as, like, his role. The coach came out pre um, before the game as well, saying that he does provide a real point of difference for them. So I'm pretty happy, generally speaking, as far as Setterfield, uh, 87 super coach, and I think he was definitely a nice serviceable option um, for them this week as well. Um, the issue, I guess he did use it a little bit poorly, I guess 62% and 72% time on ground, so a little bit lower on that element. Speaking of low time on ground, Ridley. Ridley, really, really. Now, in the preseason, we were talking about, hey, Redmond was pushing up to sort of be that outlet uh, at the back of stoppages, and then Ridley was pretty much the the main sort of quarterback type, and then when they were trying to switch, etc., everything was going through Ridley. Now, that's changed, and Ridley has found himself, he's then switched with Redmond, which is frustrating as hell to begin with. And Redmond's now seems to be the one free. Ridley's starting to push up to the back of some stoppages. And I even saw him like have Hogan and some actual accountability at some point as well. And he also spent a whole heap of time on the bench. So super frustrating. I'm extremely happy though that he did scrape an 88 because he looked like he was on track for like a 70 to 80 and it was not looking good at all. But the good thing with Ridley is he can get some intercepts and he can score well and does use it well when he gets the ball. Um, should have got another actually uh, out of 50 rebound as well. He had a kick in, so he's sharing it with Redmond. Kicks it to a guy, runs past, goes to get a handball, and then literally Callum Ward sticks his hand out, smothers the handball, and then kicks a goal. So cost him a few points there. So it could have been 90. Um, but yeah, no, um, based on that, Ridley can just get on my side. Uh, roles changed. Uh, if anything, Redmond actually looks more appealing now, but... Again, I wouldn't have too much faith in that because that role can just switch between them. And we already saw that between preseason and you know round one until now on how they just switch it up. So, yeah, avoid, avoid, avoid. Um, Ridley, get out of my side. Anyone that has him still. Now, with Essendon, there's no one else that really stands there. Like, Merritt did okay. Um, you know, Parrish did okay. Nothing really to stand out. I'm waiting for one of them to really stand up to kind of push those 115 sort of numbers. And it's not happening yet. So... Uh, Essendon do have a really soft back end of the year. So once you get to like round 10, maybe they have a super soft draw. So I'm still trying to toss up between Merritt and Parrish if one of those will actually stand up and uh, make themselves known. And um, Alwyn David Jr. had a shoulder knock as well. So he copped a bit of a hit, got some attention and then went down into the rooms and came back to finish the game. But he only ended up with a 47 super coach. So not too bad, played 72% time on ground, so obviously a little bit unders uh, compared to usual, but um, look, hopefully he gets up and plays again next week um, through that. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much Essendon in a nutshell. I'm not really seeing too much out of them at this point as far as a real standout. Um, GWS is a little bit different though, so we had um, you know Josh Kelly got a 108, 28 touches, two goals, one, so it could have been a lot higher. And, um, you know, it wasn't very contested, though. So he was a little bit more outside, only six contested possessions, which is why when you look at it and go, hey, 28 touches, uh, two goals, one, 78% disposal efficiency. But he had, you know, four clangers and was uh, only six contested out of his 28. So that's pretty much why it wasn't a huge score. So it, probably a little concerning in a, in a sense, but... Um, I still think it's a fairly good you know, option. Now, speaking of the other option, Tom Green had 17 contested possessions and racked up the pill. I mean, 16 kicks, 18 handballs. So it was at 34 touches, but went at 58% disposal efficiency. So you, you wonder where the score is. Um, at some point, it's going to all come together because the type of footy he plays 
you know, it is um, conducive to Supercoach scoring, but he's just not putting it together at the moment. So when you have a look at that, you know, good enough meters gained, um, you know, six marks, a couple of tackles. I'd like to see more tackles from him. Good amount of contested possessions, but yeah, eight clangers, 58% disposal efficiency. Um, and the only positive is 87% time on ground. So it will turn for him. Um but yeah, just the butcher. Like, there's not much more you can say about that. And speaking of the butcher, Cornelio, the first quarter master, was flying again quarter one, and then literally disappeared. So for those that had him, I think um, uh, was it JD Fantasy Take TV brought him in for Josh Kelly when he got knocked out, uh, and he's been horrible the last two weeks. So on the plus side, though, because he has been horrible, he'll drop in price. So I'll probably look at buying him at the dip while others are probably looking to abandon ship. So, um, you know, he's definitely, he's got 25 touches in this one, you know, uh, seven uh, seven clearances, five clangers, you know, nine contested, one goal. So it could have been a lot better, but yeah, just not doing as well, unfortunately, for Cornelio. So uh, I haven't seen too much about, you know, the role changing so much. Um, I think it's just Cornelio being Cornelio, to be honest. And we know he has some of those, you know, lower games in the mix. Um, Callahan was a lot more impressive. 25 touches, 88 dream team, and only 65 super coach. And again, that comes down to, you know, 68% disposal efficiency and uh, a couple of clangers as well. So, you know, on the wing there still was a little bit more impressive. But again, like a 65, it's not really going to cut it. So... If you were waiting a week, you could probably now look to move him on with some people coming on the bubble as well. Now, speaking of the bubble, Roston or Ralston, sorry. Um, yeah, I don't know why I went him instead of Phillips. It was more, hey, I know his scores weren't great, but his role was better. His job security for three to four weeks was better. Sometimes you just have to take the higher scorers and just hope for some luck. Because as we already said, Will Phillips, um, they subbed Cunnington saying he wasn't doing his role properly, so... That, if anything, just gives Phillips more job security because Cunnington got subbed out of the game because he wasn't good enough. So sometimes just take the higher scorers. Don't overthink it. Don't try and get too cute and um, go with the higher brought in ownership would have been the smarter play. But Roston, uh, Roston sorry, had 57% time on ground. Like, why even play him? 57% time on ground, seven disposals, um, one mark, one tackle. Like, he was far from impressive. And he could have been a lot better, but GWS, again, the type of game it was, the Butcher City, they just kicked it over his head like three times. So he could have had three more touches and been used as a link-up player, but his teammates can't hit a bloody target. So that's him in a nutshell. Um, Buckley, if you got on him, 80 Supercoach, uh, I hadn't really seen much of him live before today, but I thought he was actually quite impressive and strong. All of those traits that we spoke about, you know, strong in the one-on-one and getting the you know, intercept marks and, you know, a good use of my foot, all of that came to fruition and was on show today. So I thought he was actually, he looked quite strong and stable. So if you got him, the 80 super coach, he's going up again in price. So shout out as well if you did get him into your team because, or even a couple of weeks ago, because I think uh, Buckley definitely, so same thing, only 10 disposals, you know, seven tackles though, but 80 super coach. So... Um, yeah, I think he definitely had a really good game. Now, speaking of good games, yeah, I guess good games is tough tough to ask. Uh, all the GWS defenders, so Whitfield, Ash, Cumming, they're just sharing kickouts. Like, it was like one for one. I think I saw it went Cumming to Ash to Whitfield to someone, like back to one of the others. So it's killing all of their ceiling because they're all getting a little bit of it, but they're just sharing around probably the old whoever's closest scenario as far as who's getting the kickouts, but no one really has that dominant f- side where they're going to be racking up consistently, which is where I think you kind of see it come in. Um, it just kind of stalls and kills them a little bit. So I'm not that keen on that. So that's that game. Uh, let me just go and flick this one over. Uh, the next one is obviously, yeah, D's. I thought I'd throw this jacket on today. And um, this game was very interesting for a couple of reasons. And um, West Coast and Melbourne, pretty much, West Coast actually came out really strong to start with. And then they were getting flogged a little bit. So um, the important thing is Clary got matched up with with Jinbi. So, you know, a guy who's played, this is his fourth game. Um, I think it's, yeah, fourth game, something like that. So, yeah, he, he matched up on him. And that just meant that he was following Clary around pretty much just following him wherever he went most of the time. Occasionally, Gaff went to him, but um, 
the idea Jinbi was then probably more focused on Clary and less focused on getting his own ball. So he got 40 supercoach Jinbi, a lot lower than his 100 last week. Uh, probably got given more of a job for today, maybe as a learning curve because, you know, Clary is Clary. And, um, yeah, so I think that just probably stalled his, you know, um, super coach a little bit. Clary was started off a bit slow, uh, handballed it to West Coast players a couple of times and uh, worked his way into it. And the issue is, is that it could have been a little bit higher. DT to super coach ratio was a little bit higher for that. But, um, yeah, so just a little bit inefficient occasionally, like even kicking into forward 50, could have hit a mark to then maybe have a score assist, but no, he just kicks it about three metres in front of the guy. So just a little bit ineffective. I'll take the 121 as a captain option. Uh, I thought someone was going big, but in the end it was a really widespread distribution of uh, Melbourne players. Now here's a really fun fact. So Rivers, if you're in a draft league, Rivers... It looks like I would actually probably try and get him in um, high on the waiver this week, mainly because he played pure mid. Like, he was in the mid a lot. So I don't mean pure, pure mid, but he played a lot of midfield time, had 27 touches, looked extremely impressive. And, um, yeah, I think he I think he looked really good for a defender. He's, I think, 350K in super coach standard. Not sure if I'd go there for that because he'll go up in price this week. But, you know, someone definitely in draft leagues, I thought he was super impressive. Speaking of impressive, Grundy was killing it early. If he didn't give away a, a few free kicks against by just trying to outbody people or throw his weight around, you know, if he was a little bit more diligent there, he would have actually done better. But um, gave away a few frees. And, um, yeah, so, you know, he was doing well, taking it out of the ruck, kicking it, linking up really well. It was the Grundy of old. It literally was the Grundy of old. Uh, he would have he would have got a 170 or more, like a 170 or a 180, but then they just started parking him on the bench. And he played 71% time on ground. The game was done. I mean, they were, they win by 50, 63 points. They doubled the score. So there was no risk of them losing this game. So it was kind of like the old um, Marshall last night where they just kind of go, okay, well, this game's in the bag, so we'll just now rest you. So benefit is, though, he's got 144 super coach points, which means that now that break even is going to really drop because he's going to have those poor games out of his cycle. And now he's just gone like gone big and gone big again. So I really expect him to now really jump up from that 500,000. And if he goes well again next week, then you're looking at, yeah, getting straight into those sixes fairly quickly, which would be very pleasing for um, Grundy owners if you went that way this week. The other thing worth to note, um, so Petrarca started off super slow. Um, again, hit the scoreboard a little bit later. So that's where it sort of comes in. Three goals, that's where he got his 100 super coach from. Played a lot more forward than I was expecting. So now I'm kind of interested to see the CBA splits. Still got CBAs, but he was a forward out quite a bit. And um, so I'm keen to see if maybe he might scrape in for a DPP. Uh, if not now, maybe later would be the um, consideration. And then when we talk about considerations, we've got a couple of these younger players as well. So um, Chandler, if you brought him in, I guess 59, you'd be pretty happy with um, as a scraping because he looked horrible to begin with. I think third quarter he was on like 35 and um, lucky he hit the scoreboard a little bit late, had a couple of goal assists when they started to really put some scoreboard pressure on. Um, I don't think he did too much wrong. I just think it was um, because it was, you know, they try and spread it fast or go through the wing and go to Hunter, etc. I'm probably blaming more like Hunter and Langdon for not delivering it to him more. But sometimes they just blasted it or just hit up a Fritz or, or another option, which, which is fair enough. Um, the ball can't always go your way. But, you know, Chandler, I thought... It did enough to you know warrant another spot um, in another game another week. So that's the fluctuations you're going to have with a forward. Now, 59, I'll take that as, as, a, as a decent price amount. If you brought him in this week, though, expecting the 90s or whatever you had, then you'd be disappointed because you paid $200,000 for a 60, whereas I got him for 123. So anyone that did that, I think, could be quite happy. Uh, Van Ruin as well was already brought in by about 10,000 people. Went the early crow. Uh, lucky to get a 53, and I mean Lucky's in, kick two goals, one. If he didn't kick those goals, it was looking quite bleak. 74% uh, time on ground, 61% efficiency. Looks good, though, but here's the key thing to consider. He was playing on, he had Barras on him. Now, Barras is probably one of the best interceptors in the comp. So talk about getting, like, an apprenticeship. Um, yeah, Barras is no one... Really much better than that. So, like, yeah, he definitely earned his keep. He was never going to go uh, that great against Barras anyway. So I think that's definitely you know, something that you might want to take in consideration if you are considering bringing him in, having a look at the opponents coming up. Um, I thought he was serviceable enough. 
So I thought he was very serviceable. Not sure if I'd bring him in. I, I don't know if there's many other options, but I thought he did well enough. Uh, McDonald playing well, I think, helps as well. So Ben Brown might find it hard to get back in. Um, I quite like what Van Ruin actually brings to that side. So it will be interesting to see how that, that dynamic goes and what that mix-up is. But again, his job security is possibly a little bit sketchy, um, just depending on how Ben Brown goes and what they're sort of looking at doing. Uh, is all I can sort of say for that part. Um, outside of that, so yeah, Grundy, I thought, yeah, killed it. Absolutely um, impeccable. The other one to kind of note as well, so outside of Jinbi, so uh, Elliot Yo came back into this side. Looked good early on. Um, linked up a bit, played it quite a bit in defense in the end, and that Chandler actually had him on him quite a bit, which is probably frustrating because Yo is quite a good defender. Um, and then got subbed out of the game because they were managing his minutes. So anyone that t- checked out my team pod, I was talking about going like full balls out Ridley to uh, Yo as a point of difference. But um, I was lucky, you know, um, rationale prevailed because, you know, coming back from that sort of injury, it was, um, yeah, highly likely that it was going to get managed for his time. So nothing too concerning for that part. Just managed for minutes, no injury, et cetera, but just managing his time. And, um, yeah, the other one no- worth noting, Tim Kelly's gone big twice now. Last week and this week. Um, last week he had, sorry, um, last week he, I think he got about 119 or something or other, got 33 touches against, um, Fremantle and he racked it up again, 36 touches this week. So Tim Kelly's had a couple of huge weeks. So definitely someone in draft leagues, if you had him, I think he's definitely worth noting there. Longy got 49. So again, less scores for this small forwards this week. Uh, even like, you know, uh, Philippou, um, or yeah, Filippo and yeah, Baker, all the rookies. Um, Cowan and so many rookies just got between that sort of 50 to 60 mark. No one really flourishing so much this week, which is painful. And it's kind of stalling a little bit of our cash down across the board. But um, hey, hopefully that can be broken tomorrow when McKenzie gets out there as well and um, towers up an old Geelong midfield. Would be nice and nice to see. But I think that pretty much wraps us up for both games. Um, West Coast did really well for the first you know, quarter to a half and then they think they just kind of fatigued out a little bit. Melbourne were just trying to really switch it up and then go through the wings to uh, as their entry point. Uh, out, uh, except if it was like a CBA, they just go straight down the middle and um, they really do try and open up the corridor. But generally I found Melbourne would actually then almost like go corridor and then go out to the other winger because um, they're quite strong runners, which is pretty much where their strength comes into it. And that is about it, ladies and gentlemen. Let me know how you have liked this series so far. There's one more game tomorrow, so I will get into that um, tomorrow. And that's it. Let me know if I've missed anyone because I'm just doing this off the cuff. 18 minutes, too long, too ready. See you later. Who wins tomorrow in the Harley Cup, isn't it? Um, Yeah, that's it. Talk to you soon. Bye.